Hi. Um, you got my screen up there, right? Yep, we're looking good on our end. Okay. So I'm Michelle Morris. I'm the permit coordinator for the aquaculture section of Fish and Game. I facilitate the processing of aquatic resource permits for marine research and propagation and all farm related permitting. So today I'm just going to be talking about the Alaska Department of Fish and Games permitting process for aquatic farming. Let's see. Uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Games mission statement says that the goal of the department is to protect, maintain, and improve the resources of the state in the best interest of the economy and the well being of the people of the state, consistent with a sustained yield principle. This means that the state is here to help you and not inhibit development, and the various state agencies will work with you to find solutions or mitigation measures to hopefully proceed with your proposal to fit within the bounds of regulation. So in 1988, the Aquatic Farm Act was established and the regulatory authority to permit aquatic farming. And those are the regulations that it falls under. There are three types of permits issued by Alaska Department of Fishing Game. The first is the main aquatic farm or hatchery operation permit. And the operation permit is issued for 10 years and allows the permit holder to operate an aquatic farm or hatchery. This is the same application as the joint agency application. So once you submit this to DNR, you do not need to apply separately for the operation permit. The stock transport permit is issued for one year and is required to transfer stock in waters of the state to and from or between operations or the stock acquisition site. And then the aquatic stock acquisition permit is issued annually as well to collect wild stock for transfer to a hatchery or a farm. And I'll talk about these again later but there are no application fees for fish and game unless there's an intertidal clam population survey is required before an operation permit can be issued or in the case of a renewal or a transfer after 10 years, um, the fee is $100. So what are the ways that you can operate an aquatic farm in Alaska? Um, there is, you can get an aquatic farm operation permit for natural set. An aquatic farm may have species included on their operation permit they are allowed to harvest and sell depending on the type of culture method. For on bottom culture, this could include clams that were pre-existing before their permit issuance or naturally settled onto the site. After, uh, for suspended culture, species that have naturally settled into their gear may be harvested if you have that species listed on your permit. So this could be things like urchins or cucumbers or mussels, um, things like that, that settle onto your gear. This also includes aquatic plants or invertebrates. So you could sell naturally setting aquatic plants as well as cultivated ones. And then you can have uh, cultured species. So there's two ways a farm can obtain and sell cultured species. One is to get the seed from a permitted hatchery or from another farm through a stock transport permit or you can get the aquatic stock acquisition permit to collect wild stock juveniles for transport directly to the site for further rearing or harvest. In order to understand the application or how and where aquatic um, farm operation permits may be issued, let me go over the statutory criteria for issuance of an operation permit. There are five requirements. The site must be suitable for the species proposed to be cultured, the proposed farm and operation cannot conflict significantly with existing uses. The proposed farm operation may not negatively impact existing fish or wildlife and their habitat. The proposed farm demonstrates technical and operational feasibility. And five, which pertains to just on bottom culture of clams, um, not kelp farming, but the proposed farm site may not contain a significant population of wild stock. The next two slides paraphrase the regulatory review and determination criteria. So these are what follow the statutory ones that I just described. So the items in regulation pertaining to meeting those statutory requirements are that the site must be suitable. Um, if there are conflicts with existing uses, we need to identify that. And will the proposed farm operation negatively impact existing fish or wildlife and their habitat? These questions should be addressed in the joint agency application and the project description. And then continuing from the previous slide, items four and six apply to on bottom culture. So that's where you find the definition of insignif or 
insignificant populations for clams are gooey ducks. And then item five means uh, that the farm must demonstrate technical and operational feasibility through the operation and development plan. So this will be done by describing an improvement of productivity of species intended for culture that would occur above natural settings. So if you're growing something, you're already improving what was what could naturally occur. And then you need an installation schedule of your support facilities, culture gear, anchor systems. And then if there's a projected harvest rotation schedule, that needs to be consistent with the life history of the species intended for culture. So um, as with the kelp life cycle, you'll be doing that fall and sp um, fall out planting spring harvest if that's the um, type of annual species you're looking for. And then examples of improvement of productivity include uh, if you have any sort of predator exclusion devices or reduction of competing species, the importation of species or any habitat improvement. The joint agency application is designed to gain this information and address these statutes and regulatory criteria. Then jumping over to, um, this is a snapshot from the NOAA permitting portal flow chart. Um, I'm not sure if you've got anybody describing this to you today, but the NOAA permitting portal is an excellent resource that was um, a multi-agency um, endeavor where we described and all put in inputs to what you need um, in order to get going with aquatic farming. So just that blue and green section number three there, that represents the joint agency process with DNR and Fish and Game. And then at the end there, you can see those three types of permits that fishing game issues, which is that operation permit, stock transport permit, and stock acquisition permit. Um, if you are in the Kachemak Bay critical habitat area, then you do need a special area permit just for that one area. And then here, I'm gonna give you just a close-up flow chart of just that fishing game section and how we process the aquatic farm operation permit application. Of course, the very first step is to complete that joint agency application and submit it with the application fee to DNR. Then DNR and Fishing Game will review the application together and determine if there's any required information missing or needs further clarification. Once that application is considered complete, DNR will post a 20-day agency review notice. This is where Fishing Game begins its preliminary review of the application. If the department review results in any sort of concerns or conflicts, the department will work with the applicant to find ways to mitigate those concerns if possible. This could be simply moving a corner of your parcel, moving it to another side of a bay, um, so that way it doesn't conflict with existing uses or overlaps. Um, after the agency review is done, Fish and Game will wait until the final outcome from the DNR process. If DNR issues the lease, then Fish and Game has to make its final decision within 30 days of the proposal. But at this point, we've already gone through any sort of mitigations, so it's very highly unlikely that you would get your lease but not get your Fish and Game operation permit. If the operation permit is denied, there is a chance for appeal, but otherwise the permit is issued. And like I said, it's very highly unlikely that your Fish and Game operation permit will go to appeal because by that time, we've already ironed out any sort of wrinkles. So I'll be talking about that joint agency application now and describe what materials are required to apply for that DNR lease and fishing game aquatic farm operation permit. First of all, of course, you need to fill out the application itself. This application was redone back in 2021 and it is so much improved compared to the older version. It's a wonderful fillable PDF version, and it's available through the DNR website or through the NOAA uh, permitting portal. Along with the application, you will need several maps and diagrams that are required. You'll need a general location map, which is a larger scale USGS map showing the surrounding area. You need a detailed location map, which uses the NOAA nautical chart of a smaller scale showing more detail and boundaries of each farm parcel with coordinates on each corner. The site plan map is the overhead view, which details um, including not, but not limited to the boundaries of the, each farm parcel, the distance between the parcels, your anchoring systems, equipment, support facility dimensions, and locations of any eelgrass beds, kelp beds, or anadromous streams. And then you'll do a cross-sectional diagram, which uh, includes the distancing from the bottom to your gear or any structures or anchoring systems to the ocean floor and what that distance is at mean low tide. And any detailed drawings for support facilities or equipment 
and gear showing the dimensions and identifying any construction materials. On the Fishing Game website, there's a couple of these helpful maps and cross-sectional diagram examples. Um, the requirements for each of the maps is listed in the application. So make sure that each of these requirements are met or the application may be considered incomplete. Don't forget you need a legend, a scale, north directional arrow, uh, arrow parcel point labels, and depths. Um, the AU's Mariculture map that Tamsin mentioned earlier is also linked on that NOAA permitting portal, and it's got templates for creating these required maps for the different agencies. Um, it even will do your U.S. Army Corps engineers mapping requirements as well. Uh, so here's a snapshot of the AU's Mariculture map. And so this online tool already has the various map layers available. Um, so prospective farmers, can you can make informed decisions when picking your site. And then when you're ready to make your maps for the uh, Joint Agency Application or Army Corps, it's got that drop down list in that top left corner and it tells you you can pick your general location map, your site plan, or your detailed map, and it will already preload those um, base layers and what requirements you need in order to submit your application. There are several questions on the application that are part of the overall project description. Remember that uh, you need to describe each type of species intending to be cultured. If you're planning on um, multiple kelp species, they can be summarized into a single description unless your culture or harvest methods are different. So if you're doing bull kelp, you might need a little bit of longer time or you have a different culture system because of how buoyant it is, so you need more weights on that type of line, or if you're going to do giant kelp that's a year-round species, then make sure to describe these in different sections. If you're going to do oysters and kelp, then you need to have um, a couple of operation plans describing each of these methods. This project description narrative will help demonstrate that technical and operational feasibility so we can satisfy those requirements in the regulation. The project description in your application asks the following questions. First of all, what is your culture method? How do you intend on growing your species? What husbandry techniques will you use? How often are you going to visit your site for maintenance and monitoring? How do you intend on keeping your gear and product free from fouling or incidental species? When will you plant seed, rotate your gear, or transfer your methods to other methods of growing? And then what is your cultural gear? So how much and how, what type of gear do you intend on installing? This includes anchors and buoys. And then what is your 10-year plan for installation and gear? Do you plan on starting small and working up to the full site potential over 10 years? Will you be installing and removing gear annually? And please note exactly what you'll be removing annually. So if you want to leave in your main corner anchors all year round, then say that you're going to leave those but remove anything else, all your suspended stuff. And so this is really important because this will address any concerns with overlapping seasons or existing traditional uses in the area of the proposed farm. And this will also help greatly when it goes out to public notice that the public has a really informed um, idea of what your farm site and operations are going to be looking at. Um, seed acquisition. Have you investigated where you'll be obtaining your seed from? Some facilities right now may already be maxed out in capacity for, protect, for production. So the Fishing Game website has an online seed source that lists all the hatcheries that are permitted. So you can go and make sure you reach out to any potential facilities in your area and start making inquiries on who will be making your seed for you. Don't assume that anybody already has space. And your harvest methods. How frequently will you harvest and by what methods? Support facilities, will you have a work float or float house? Are you going to have on-site housing um, or an on-site processing facility? There are separate fees with DNR for certain structures, and then DEC will need to be involved if you're going to do any sort of on-site food processing. And where will the gear be stored when it's not in use? Are you going to have some upland uses, going to private property, or what are you going to do with that gear? Um, if you're going to use upland use on state-owned tidelands, that, that needs to be included with part of your DNR lease. So due to lack of information about kelp population structure and distribution, Fishing Game is currently taking a precautionary approach to where kelp broodstock can be acquired in relation to the farm site to minimize risk of genetic or disease impacts on wild populations of aquatic plants. So one condition of the aquatic 
stock acquisition permit and the transport permit is that the brood stock or the parent plants must be collected within 50 kilometers by water of outplanting to the farm site and consist of 50 individual plants. All the kelp blades not need to be collected from one spot. It's actually preferred that your collection be distributed among kelp beds within range to promote genetic diversity. This operating procedure will likely be in place until the department has a better understanding of the genetic disposition and of the wild natural populations of macroalgae. So there's currently lots of studies going on. Um, they'll probably request that you send in genetic samples. So whenever you're collecting for hatchery, you may also be sending in samples to fish and game, and then we'll get a better understanding of what those genetic population structures are. So once you receive your DNR lease and fish and game operation permit, again, don't forget, there are still other permissions you will need um, from other locations. So back to that big giant flow chart, don't forget you need to check with the Army Corps engineers for a letter permission or if you fall within one of their general permits. It's recommended you can do this at least um, after you've reached that preliminary decision with DNR. That way you can avoid any changes to your Army Corps permit application, but then that way you can start doing these simultaneously. If you're planning on selling any product for consumption right away from your site, don't forget you need to talk with DEC. You may need some water quality samples um, and then any uh, determination for food handling permits. Once you're ready to put your gear in the water, you need to acquire seed from a hatchery or permitted farm site. So for kelp, you will need to be in contact with that facility that will agree to make the seed alliance for you. You may need to collect the appropriate uh, adult kelp blades for them, but the hatchery is the one responsible for getting and reporting those collections. So as Tamsin noted, make note for where you get them and how much you collect, um, but the hatchery needs to get that acquisition permit to get there the adult plants to their facility, but they may ask you to collect on their behalf. The receiving entity is the one who needs to get those transport permits. So the hatchery is receiving the brood stock, so they will get the acquisition permits, but your farm site will be receiving the seeded line. So therefore your farm needs to get that stock transport permit to get that seeded line from the hatchery to your farm site. These two types of permits can be coordinated and applied for at the same time to reduce processing time. Once you're on operation, an annual report needs to be filed by January 31st of each year. The annual report is required even if no activities were conducted during the operation year. This is how DNR and Fish and Game will assess if you're meeting those regulatory criteria to improve productivity or meet the DNR commercial use requirements. These annual reports are also used for determining if a renewal will be granted after 10 years. If you want to add species, gear, or acreage, you will need to amend your fishing game operation permit and possibly your DNR lease. And then keep in touch with various farmers and support groups so that you can share ideas and issues and promote farm to table sales, or even let you know about funding opportunities. I'm sure you'll hear about a bunch of these different uh, groups throughout this workshop, but here's a list of a few of them here in Alaska. And then just as an overview, I thought I'd give you the, the 10 year history of applications by type. So the first aquatic farm permit for kelp was applied for and issued in 2016, seven years ago. Uh, since then, there have previously been a lull in the aquatic farm applications from the last surge was in 2005. So only 54 applications from 2006 to 2016. But then since 2017, the number of applications has rapidly increased to a new high of 23 applications in just last year alone, and 16 applications were for aquatic plants only. And then now that you're aware that there's a definitely an increasing interest in aquatic farm applications, how do you submit a successful application? So when you have a particular location in mind, do your research. Visit your site during different times of the year. Does it ice up? Is it protected from, um, is it protected or is it a common place for vessels to shelter? Um, existing fisheries in the winter or summertime? Check with your local fish and game area office and they can let you know what those fisheries are and what the timing of the year would be. Um, is there nearby cabins? Is it a popular public loose location. Find out uh, who the upland owners are if you can, 
And then the more potential conflicts you can resolve before you submit your application, the smoother the process will be. Don't forget to use those check boxes in the joint agency application to make sure that all your materials are there and all the maps have the pertinent information. Make sure your information across all the materials is consistent. The number of anchors, lines, and structures and dimensions. Um, we find a lot of times people put one thing on their map but write something else in their project description. So make sure that um, it's consistent across the board. If you're unsure on how to fill out a certain section of the application, feel free to contact us. You can contact myself, Fish and Game, DNR, even NOAA, or UAF Sea Grant, Green Wave. All of, there's a bunch of independent contractors out there. Um, they will help you complete that application. So once you do, the process will be quicker. More, the process a completed application will process a lot faster than one that was turned in earlier but missing information. Be responsive and available. Many times the delay in application processing is us waiting on the applicant to provide additional information. Make sure your contact is listed and what is your best method of contact. If you know you're going to be out of service for the summer, you're a commercial fisherman, make sure you have someone who can be contacted. Otherwise, you may find out when you come back that your application is sitting exactly where you left it due to missing information and you've lost all that processing time. And then, yeah, here's my contact information. And if you do, is there any questions? Cool. Thanks, Michelle. Um, if anyone has a quick question, I'm going to switch it over to um, Brent with ADNR. Um, we're a little behind, so sorry for the wait, Brent. And thank you so much, Michelle. That was really great. Um, I'll, I'll try and make mine quicker. That's okay. You don't have no need to rush. <laughs> Kale has a question for Michelle. Oh, um, I was just wondering if there's any different rules or lighter permitting for processing at sea if you wanted to do either like blanching on board of a vessel to like prepare it for freezing in town. Um, how complicated would that be? Did you hear that? Would that? Be, I did hear it, yes. Um, that would be a DEC question. So um, any food handling or processing, you would have to talk with DEC. And I don't know if there's any difference between where your location is. They'll probably have the same requirements depending if you're doing it at sea or on land. But um, you, you can reach out to DEC. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, next up is Brent Reynolds with ADNR. More permitting. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent. I'll make this, uh, try and make this a, a little quick because I know I know you guys are a little bit behind on, on things. And um, some of the information you'll see will be um, similar to what Michelle introduced to you. Some will be a little bit different because our process is a little bit different than fish and games. Um, I've been with the aquatic farm program since uh, the latter half of 2018. I'm a part of a three team, uh, three person team that does all the adjudication for the leases for aquatic farms. Uh, and like Michelle said, we're, I know fish and game and I know we are too, the adjudicators we're here um, for the applicant, we're here for the lessee. So if you ever have any questions, please reach out to us. And at the end of this presentation, there'll be a slide with our information. Uh, first and foremost, what is an aquatic farm lease with the state? Uh, it is a 10-year property right granted by the Division of Mining Land and Water that allows a lessee to utilize a state land for commercial shellfish and aquatic plant. Uh, just like fish and game, uh, we have our, our leases are governed by individual sets of statutes and regulations, um, AS 3805-83 and 11 AAC-63. And 11 AAC 63 uh, states that an aquatic farm site lease will be in the commissioner's best discretion, be issued for tideland, submerged land, and shoreland managed by the department under Alaska Statute 38, but will not include land within a state park or other land that has been withdrawn from the state's public domain. Now the fun stuff. How do I apply for the aquatic farm lease? So. 
Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, the open application period runs from January 1st through April 30th each year. However, that does not stop us or any applicant from discussing aquatic farms prior to that. I've had meetings with potential applicants starting as early as September, October to start discussing locations, um, to start looking at application things. Um, and the earlier we can get in touch together, the better off and, sm and more smoothly things will go once that application season is open. Um, it was stated earlier that applications, when, they, when we receive them, they do go in line of first received. However, any application that is complete will be the first one to be sent out for agency review. So if someone submitted an application January 1st and by April 30th still wasn't complete and somebody submitted one April 30th and it was complete, we're going to go ahead and start adjudicating that complete application because there's no reason for anybody to wait. Uh, there are three state agencies that review the application. Uh, DNR, Fish and Game, and DEC if they need to. And applicants will also need to inquire with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, National Marine Fisheries Service, and other, other federal agencies for their requirements as well. Some of those other federal agency requirements we won't know about until the public notice is done or, you know, the final finding is sent out and then, and then we're told, um, especially like U.S. Coast Guard. We may not find out that there has to be uh, a, a permit from them until the public notice is, is out and they send in a comment stating that. Um, so a lot of times we, we won't know until, until then. So it does take a little bit of time. Application fee for aquatic farm site lease varies by the size of the aquatic farm. If it's one acre or less, the fee is $600. If it's greater than one acre, but no more than three, it's $1,200. And any farm greater than three acres, the application fee is $2,000. Uh, Michelle kind of went over some of the tips for completeness. Um, read all the application instructions, consider the submittals and, and fees that are required. And I've got a slide a little bit later that just kind of has a breakdown of year one and year two for fees. Complete each page as instructed. Jump, uh, double check the information for consistency. And I know Michelle went over that. That includes the application, the project description, maps, drawings. So if it's in the project description as one thing, please make sure that that matches what your maps have and your diagrams. Um, all structures, including all anchors and lines must be within the proposed site footprint. So if you're asking for a, a rectangle that's three acres, but you're proposing to put your anchors outside of that, those four corners that won't be allowed. Everything has to be within the parcel itself. The leasing process summary. This is, I think this is where everybody, and hopefully I can answer questions before they're even asked, but this is, I guess, the, the meat and potatoes of what DNR does. Once we receive the application and it's reviewed by us, Fish and Game, DEC, if it's incomplete, we'll send out a request for, for further information. Um, sometimes that does go back and forth for a couple of times. We may get updates to the application. They may not be completely correct. So we'll send another RFAI back out to the applicant. Once we receive everything and DNR says, okay, for us, application is complete. And Fish and Game says, hey, for us, application is complete. We'll, we'll draft up and send out a 20-day agency notice for a review period. Uh, that 20 days gives all state agencies and local agencies as well a time to comment on your project description, your maps, and your diagrams, everything that you're wanting to do with the proposed farm. All of those comments after that 20-day review notice, uh, review period is completed, all of those comments are then read and we start our preliminary decision process where we, we will research the classification uh, and planning area for, for your proposed site. Um, if it's in an area where there's traditional uses, we'll do a traditional use finding. Uh, and then we will lay out all of the comments that were received during the agency review period and we'll answer those. If any agency has any issues 
uh, that they see, that's a time where we can communicate with the applicant to try and mitigate some of the issues. Um, sometimes fish and game may come to us and say, hey, this is in a, an area where there's a lot of commercial fishing that's done from June to September. Um, and so we'll talk to the applicant and the applicant will say, hey, I'm going to remove all of my lines except for my anchors from June 1st to October 1st. And so that's that mitigation that we're kind of looking for uh, to be able to move forward with, with that preliminary decision. Um, once the preliminary decision is drafted and reviewed and signed by the regional manager for the South Central Regional Office, that preliminary decision is then sent out for a 30-day public notice. Anybody that comments during that period uh, has the opportunity to appeal our final finding and decision. Any comments that come in during that 30-day public notice is then um, answered within the final finding and decision. And so depending on how many comments come in, uh, there could be one or two, and it takes us no time at all to draft out a final finding and get it into review. There could be, I, I've had as many as 35, 40 comments come in uh, that then we have to research, answer. Um, we'll communicate with the applicant to try and do more mitigation if needed. We'll communicate with the applicant to get their response to some of the comments that come in. Um, and so that, that is another process that does take some time and some back and forth with the applicant. Once that final finding and decision is written and signed, there is a 20 day appeal period. So like I said, anybody that comments on the preliminary decision during that initial 30 day public notice, anybody that comments during that time and the applicant can appeal the final finding and decision that's written by DNR. The final administrative order and decision will go into effect 31 days after the final finding is issued, and that's when your lease term begins. So if, if we signed March 1st, the final finding was signed by the regional manager, 31 days later is when the, the lease term begins. That is the one thing that as adjudicators, we can't change that. Um, so regardless of how long it takes to get the annual lease fee to us or the bonding or the insurance, that lease will actually start 31 days after the final finding has been, has been signed. Uh, if, if there's no issues with the final finding or if the adjudicators think, hey, you know what, this isn't gonna get appealed, about 15 days into that, we'll send out the lease documents, we'll send out letters stating what, what we need as far as the fees, the bonding, the insurance requirements and all of that to, to help give time uh, for the applicant to start working on getting that to us. If, it's an, if there is an appeal on the final finding and decision, whether it's from the applicant or whether it's from anyone that commented during that 30 day public notice, um, the adjudicator is no longer allowed to speak to the applicant after that. It then goes to our appeal office uh, and then we will we'll give you the information and the point of contact to talk to about the appeal. Annual lease fees. Um, this is the newest report that, that has come out, 2522-15. Um, so annual lease fees for, for a farm up to 30 acres, it's $450 for the first acre or portion thereof and then $125 for each additional acre or a portion thereof. So for example, a two acre farm site, the annual lease fee would be $575. Anything above 30 acres, um, the report contains a table with base fees and costs are reduced from that extra 125 per acre. So an example for a 35 acre lease, the base price for 30 acres is $4,075 and then five extra acres at 109 for a grand total yearly of 4620. And then there are additional costs that would be associated with housing facilities for an aquatic farm site if there was a caretaker facility within the parcel uh, or upland facilities, um, there would be additional, house, uh, additional costs associated with that. So year one, um, your, your typical cost for year one, and this will be based on a two-acre site. You'd have a $1,200 application fee. 
the minimum uh, performance guarantee bond for any farm is $2,500. The annual lease fee for the first acre of 450 and then the second acre at 125. So your first year cost for a two acre farm just that has to be submitted to DNR is $4,275. For year two, all you would be paying to DNR would be the annual lease fee, which, is, which would be 450 for that first acre and then 125 for the second acre, and that's 575. That's not including the cost of insurance or business license or anything outside of DNR. There is a commercial use requirement, um, commercial use of the site no later than the fifth year of the lease operations and continues for the rest of the lease term. Commercial use means annual sale of an aquatic farm product of at least $3,000 per acre or fraction of an acre or $15,000 per farm, whichever is less. Um, we understand things happen. We understand storms happen. Um, we, we understand COVID happens. We understand um, buyers aren't found. Uh, so if we can get something on those annual reports that say, this is why things weren't sold, or this is why, then, then we can utilize that to move forward once you start looking at renewal. Um, commercial use really comes into play when we look at renewing the lease uh, for an additional 10 year term. Uh, but if you're in communication with us and let us know what's going on, let us know, you know, why there hasn't been a lot of sales or why you haven't had any sales, um, that'll go a long way. So just open communication with us will certainly help. Our current program status right now, uh, we administer 78 aquatic farm leases right now that range in acres from one to 182. The total statewide authorized acreage right now is uh, 1,108 1, acres. 49% uh, of that is in Southeast, 29% of that is in South Central, and 22% is in the Kodiak area and the Peninsula area. For kelp only, we have 33 active kelp farms, either all kelp or partial with kelp. Uh, the statewide authorized acreage for kelp is 808, and that is a 90% increase from 2021. So in 2022, we had 808 acres, um, and that is a huge increase. We do have 33 pending kelp authorizations, totaling 2,043 acres. Of those 33 pending kelp application or kelp authorizations, over half of those were waiting on applicants to receive their annual lease fees, the bond or insurance. Um, so we can't actually issue or authorize the lease until we receive all, all of those deliverables. Uh, aquatic farm site sales from the 2021 annual reports. Um, we're, I think we're still receiving some from 2022. So I wanted to give concrete numbers to you all. Um, so I pulled everything from the 2021 annual reports. So our overall sales, which includes oysters, mussels, and kelp, was one, a little over 1.8 million, um, and that is up 82% from 2020. For kelp only was 298,000, which was up 99% from 2020. And as you can see from the graph, uh, it sort of mirrors the applications that we receive. It, it, we have a nice trajectory going up, and that's, that's awesome, especially for aquatic farming. I'll leave this up just for a second. So if you want to jot down information, we do have a nice website. Uh, we've got uh, frequently asked questions on there. We've got other links to other agencies. Um, we've got an email that goes directly to uh, all everybody in the aquatic farm program. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, I'll try and do my best to answer. Brent, I have a question. Um, and it's about subleasing. So we have several um, permitted farm sites around our area of Prince William Sound, but nobody is planting and talking to some of the farmers. They don't really have plans to plant just yet. Would those sites be available for other potential farmers to sublease from um, the leaseholders? So currently we don't do subleasing for aquatic farming. 
Uh, that is, I, I can say, and I will tell you all this, that that is something that we have been discussing with our managers and, and upper managers within DNR um, is to have the availability to sublease. Um, so as of right now, subleasing isn't anything that, that we can do. The only, the only option that you would have is if you don't like you, if you don't want to continue leasing that specific parcel, you could do an assignment to somebody, um, or they could operate under your business license that you have. Hmm. Any other questions? Michelle, you have something to add to that? Yeah, um, same thing with fishing game. We don't do a, an official sort of sublease or, you know, redirection, but you can have a business arrangement with that person on your own as long as the actual owner or the, the name that the lease or the permit is under submits the annual report or gets the acquisition permits you can have someone else work your farm and just be like employing somebody else to work your site so we don't have a technical uh, or official you know reassignment but you can do it with your own personal business arrangement but that would be we would recommend of course you probably get something signed or some sort of contract to make sure that they pay the lease fees and you would just have to transfer anything you had to their name um, for the annual reporting and stuff like that. Great, thank you. I have another question about maps too. Um, so for the research farms that are in our area, um, so NBE's farm, and then I know that there are nine other sites with the Native Conservancy and maybe a few others, those aren't on any of the maps. Um, and one question I've had from mariners is, how do I know where the farms are? I don't wanna run over a farm in the middle of the night. Um, so I've directed them to that great ADF and G uh, website that has all the parcels, but it doesn't have the research farms. Are there any plans to get the research farms on the maps? Um, if their research, if their research farms are permitted through DNR through the our permitting section, then they'll be on Alaska Mapper, which you can utilize. You can find that through the DNR website, a lot, or you can just do a Google search, Alaska Mapper. And one of the layers on Alaska Mapper will be permits and leases. And when you click that and pull that up, you would just have to zoom in to a specific area to see if that was an aquatic farm or not, or give us a call at the office and we can help you out with that, with, with kind of working that Alaska Mapper side of it. As far as getting those on any other maps, right now, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if our GIS folks are talking to their GIS folks on transferring all of those over. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, so this is Michelle. Um, the difference between the research sites and the aquatic farm sites, um, of course, is the permitting. So those research sites are temporary. They're like one year at a time type of a deal. And uh, the lease that goes with it, or, I'm sorry, it's not a lease, it's called an LAS. And so if you go to that DNR mapper, you can see LASs, but it will show you every LAS, which means you're gonna get set net sites, you're gonna get mooring buoys, you're gonna get everything. So we don't wanna populate our fishing game mapper to show a billion other things that are out there that are not even aquatic farm related or research related even some of them are like i said they're mooring buoys or set net sites or a variety of other permissions from dnr so right now that fishing gate only shows permitted aquatic farms but if you do use the dnr mapper it will show you where people have applied for so you'll get pending leases you can see if somebody's already applied for a spot because it'll show up on that dnr mapper Excellent. Thank you. That's really valuable information. 